Hi everyone, welcome to today's webinar uh, on fundamental trading strategy part one brought to you by Tickmill. All right, just, just wait a couple of minutes for everyone to, um, to tune in. All right, so we are broadcasting this via Zoom exclusively on Zoom. So this is the only platform where you'll be able to watch this um, uh, webinar. So my name is Ketan. Uh, and yeah, so just before we start, I can see everyone coming in. Hi guys, hi everyone. Right, okay. We also have the chat going as well. All right, just gonna, All right. So yeah, so at any point in time, please feel free to uh, drop your questions, right? I'll be happy to answer all of your uh, questions along the way as we progress through today's webinar, right? Okay, I think we've got, Everyone coming in today, mostly everyone is in. All right. Okay, excellent guys. Okay, so all right. So <clears throat> let's let, let's start. Okay, so today's uh, session is on fundamental trading strategy part one. Okay, so just a quick disclaimer before we start, right? This ma material provided here is for information purposes and should not be considered as uh, investment advice, right? The views, information, and opinions expressed here belong solely to the author. Uh, me today, right? Okay. And also I would like to highlight the high risk warning uh, disclaimer as well. CFDs are complex instruments, right? It comes with a high risk as well. So please do all due diligence before putting on any trades. All right. Okay. Hi. All right. Yeah. Okay. The chat's working as well. Excellent. So hi Neeraj. Hi Paul. Okay, guys. Welcome. All right. Okay. So so I said, okay, so my name is Ketan. Yeah, Ketan Ramachandra. I'm from uh, Everest Fortune Group. So we have a part, special partnership with Tickmill where we bring you the best analysis and webinars as well. So uh, EFG has been the best, has won several awards of which you can see our uh, best FX research in 2019, 2020, 2021, as well as best equity research uh, at 2020, 2021. So this was the uh, technical analysis awards, right? Okay, so now that we've uh, got things going, we've got the disclaimers out, let's just start. Okay, so today's agenda. Okay, what will we be covering today? We'll be looking at the information resource. So where do we get all the info on fundamental, uh, to help us with fundamental analysis? And we'll also be looking at central banks. What do they do with regards to monetary policy, uh, their meeting schedules, as well as potential interventions. And we'll also be looking at some of the key economic data and how it impacts Forex movements as well. And for today's session, we'll round up with the US dollar index and its composition. Okay. Right. Okay. Okay. So first of all, information resource. Okay. So the good thing is, I'm sure most of you have heard of Forex Factory. So Forex Factory is like a, uh, uh, the good thing is it's a central depository where we have the economic calendar and not only does it have the calendar itself, it also has the links to the actual sources for each of the respective economic events. So whether it's from the United States, the Eurozone, Australia, New Zealand, all the data uh, links are provided in Forex Factory as well. Okay, so you just if you click on Forex Factory and then you look for the economic calendar, you will be able to find all the details, all right? Okay, Jamilu as well, testing out the chat. All right, hi Jamilu, okay. Uh, so, okay, so let's just have a quick look at Forex Factory, right? So you guys are all familiar with this page, Forex Factory. So let's just run a quick uh, example. Okay, so let's do today, okay. So all the timings are in UTC plus eight, uh, plus zero, sorry. So yeah, it's GMT time. Yep, just to make sure we're all in the time zone. This is GMT timing. Okay, so let's just look at, uh, okay, let's just look at from easy from March till now. Okay, so 1st of March till 24th April. Let's just put this our calendar setting and then we'll search and then you can, uh, so, uh, you guys should be familiar with this. You can set your time frame uh, period and then you can filter for the uh, uh, data that you're looking for. So usually I pick the two most impactful uh, 
options and of course event types i'll choose all the events so let's just start off with uh us data right because we all know the federal reserve is the biggest central bank in the world and whenever they do anything with regards to monetary policy or any other actions everyone is impacted by it right or usually the other central banks will follow suit and will uh, react in a similar fashion okay so let's just look at from the US perspective first. Okay, so we apply the filter. So we've got a few uh, economic data points. Okay, so first we'll start off by looking for the uh, Federal Reserve FOMC meeting event, right? That took place in March. We had the, here we go, yes, on 22nd of March, right? The FOMC meeting ran from 22nd to 23rd March. Okay, so over here, you can see, okay, federal funds rate, this is the interest rate. So we all know, if we click on uh, this graph icon here, you're able to see the history of how the Fed has been raising interest rates, cutting them, and then raising interest rates again. So in this last uh, year and a half, the Fed has been aggressively raising interest rates. It is actually has been the quickest um, rate of increases since the 1970s, which was when the last inflation, uh, highly inflationary period occurred. So the Fed, together with all the other central banks, have been raising infl uh, interest rates in order to combat inflation. Okay, So we can see a brief history of how interest rates have been raised, cut, held low, and then raised again. Okay, Now if you click, click on the folder icon, Right, we are able to uh, get a brief description of what this economic data is all about and where uh, wh what is the source. So if you click on latest release, it will take you to the FOMC website. So the FOMC basically stands for Federal Open Market Committee. Right? The committee is made up of several members and the chairman. And of course, Jerome Powell should be a very familiar name for everyone. Okay, so over here, as you can see, you'll have the... Uh, links for the previous years as well. And of course, for 2023. So we are able to see the uh, schedule for 2023 in terms of the meetings. And not only are we able to see uh, the dates, upcoming dates, right? So the next one we have in May next week, right? All eyes will be on this. But not only do we have the schedule, but we also have access to the statement. So you are able to read the statements as well. If you click on PDF, if you wish, you can feel, I can read through the statement in detail to find out more exactly what they're talking about. And oops, okay, I didn't mean to close that. Okay. And not only that, you have also links for the press conferences, right? Because it's it's a two thing, two step uh, uh, process. So the first is they'll announce the interest rates, changes that they have done. And, they will also release the statement and after which the chairman, Jerome Powell, will uh, run a press conference as well where he will answer several questions and update things that are not included in the statement. So if you wish to watch the conference as well, uh, you are able to do so, okay? So this is here. And also the other thing that's get, that gets released after each FOMC meeting are the minutes as well. So sometimes the minutes can have an impact on currency markets as uh, the contents and details of the minutes usually might not be discussed in detail during the press conference or it might not be even be included in the statement because is, as you can see, the statement is a quite a brief document with about four pages. And whereas if you were to look at the minutes, the minutes are more detailed, right? Com comprising of almost 10 pages of written text where they actually go and uh, look at all the major discussion points. So this that is why sometimes minutes can have an impact on currency markets as well. So this is where we can uh, get all this information. Okay, so for the Federal Reserve, if you go back to Forex Factory, you look for the event called FOMC uh, Statement, Federal Funds Rate. Okay. So this is where, like I said, click on the uh, 
folder icon and then you can click on latest release it'll take you to their website which is here and then you can uh, go in detail dive in and explore the minutes uh the press conferences and the statements as well okay uh since we are on the topic of the federal reserve and the next meeting that's coming up next week one tool that i like to use is uh it's called the cme fed watch tool okay so if you want to key this in in google okay so cme fed watch tool whether you leave a space or not leave a space i think it shouldn't matter you should still get the right results if you click on that right it takes you to the cme group and the first link is the one that we want cme fed watch tool so this is a very useful uh website where we are able to see the target probability target rate probabilities for each uh upcoming meeting right so the next week we're having the meeting on the 3rd of may current interest rates are between 475 and 500 so this is in terms of basis points so what this basically means is uh 100 basis points is one percent so basically we're looking at 4.75 percent to five percent okay hi Neeraj. okay there's a question on best website for goal analysis okay uh we won't be covering goal today uh probably i can try and do this in part two right okay Thank you for your question. Yeah, uh, I will try and see if I can put this in for next the next session. Okay. So, okay. So this tool tells us what the Fed is likely to do at the next upcoming meeting. So this uh, website is always running and the target probabilities are always being calculated. So currently the interest rates are at 4.75 to 5%. And what this is telling us is the target rate. Okay. So uh from let's just look at the upper band so the upper band is currently at five percent or 500 basis points and now there's a 85 percent probability that interest rates are going to be raised by uh 25 uh basis points okay there's another question uh part to which date okay i believe just stay tuned uh on your usual tick mail uh website and your emailers you'll be getting the information uh, through those regular media channels, right? The, uh, the, I'm sure uh, the information will be uh, uh, well released and marketed uh, as in due in, in due time. Okay, so okay, so what this website is telling us that there's an 85 percent chance that the Federal Reserve is going to raise interest rates by 25 basis points, bringing the upper range to 525 basis points. So that's 5.25 percent. So this website is constantly updated with the latest probabilities. So we know beforehand what the Fed is very likely to do. Okay, so once you know what the Fed is very like, is uh, you can you're basically anticipating what the Fed is doing. You don't actually have to wait for the meeting, right? So you already know beforehand, one week in advance, a few days in advance, what the Fed is going to do, and it's very likely some of the moves get gets priced in before, um the statement is released right and the meeting takes place so this is one tool that i would like to use and it's very easy to search for it just remember cme space fed watch space tool you can bookmark it for future references and you can also you'll be able to do it for uh track the probabilities for future meetings after next week's okay Right, so the CME Fed Watch tool. Okay, so now if we go back to our slides. Okay, so we talked about the data links where we can get. Okay, then we will also look at. Uh, let me see. What do I? Ah, okay. So I I had showed you guys the links, right? Okay, so let's bring up the slides. Okay, so remember Forex Factory. From there, you are able to look for the relevant economic event be it from the federal reserve the european central bank uh rba reserve bank of australia right so what we looked at here was the federal reserve monetary policy calendar and these are all the other links related to gdp which is by bea bureau of economic uh, analysis you have ism which is institute for supply management which releases pmi results 
uh, purchasing manager index surveys for the manufacturing and services sector. BLS is Bureau of Labor Statistics, where you can get information on the employment report, CPI, PPI, right? Okay. And right. Okay. So this is the data links. So primarily, once you have Forex Factory, you can find the others and just bookmark all the relevant uh, economic events that you think are important for you, right? Okay, central banks. Let's just quickly touch on central banks. Okay, so as mentioned earlier, the Federal Reserve is the largest central bank uh, in the world. And when they raise interest rates or cut interest rates, it has a major impact on the rest of the world, right? And usually all the other central banks follow suit, right? So as we know, for the last 18 months or so, the Federal Reserve has been hiking interest rates aggressively. And this includes the European Central Bank, Swiss National Bank, BOE, BOC, RBA, RBNZ. The only central bank that stands out out of this list is the Bank of Japan, right? Despite rising inflation uh, globally, or, yep, I'm sorry, despite inflation rising globally, the Bank of Japan is the only central bank that has actually uh, maintained its interest rates at negative 0.1%, while the rest have all been hiking aggressively. So there's a big divergence in monetary policy between the Bank of Japan and the rest of the other central banks. Okay, so this is also quite important because when you know uh, what the major central banks are doing, you're able to see, what we also would like to see is look out, look out for divergence, right? So what do I mean by divergence by in monetary policy, uh, monetary policy action? Basically, when one central bank is hiking, another one could be uh, pausing or cutting rates. So in this case, let's just look at the Federal Reserve and Bank of Japan, right? The Federal Reserve was aggressively rise, uh, raising interest rates throughout 2022 whereas the BOJ was keeping its rate as negative 0.1%. So you have a big divergence in uh, policy actions. It is also reflected in, in the bond yields as well. And also ultimately it gets reflected in the currency pair, which is the US dollar and Japanese yen. Okay, so when we know that there's such a big divergence going on in monetary policy, with regards to monetary policy action, it is probably... Uh, logically, we would think that, yes, the Federal Reserve is uh, raising rates. Bank of Japan is keeping it at negative 0.1. And not only is the Federal Reserve raising rates, they were doing it very aggressively. It's very logical to think that the dollar yen will gain against, or uh, the dollar yen will rise, right? USD, JPY, dollar yen will rise. And this is what has exactly happened. So if we were to go to trading view, and you look at the dollar yen. Okay, this is uh okay. Hang on, sorry. This is a daily chart. Okay, right. Wait, let me just zoom out so we can see the start of twenty twenty two. Right. Okay. So this was the period in March where the Federal Reserve started raising rates. Right. The first one kicked off in March, and they raised seventy five basis points at in each of the first, I think, three or four meetings. So this was the fastest and most aggressive rate hike uh, action carried out by the Fed, while at the same time, the Bank of Japan kept its interest rates at negative 0.1%. So in this scenario, we can tell that, okay, logically, like we said, right, logically thinking, if one bank is raising interest rates, the other is keeping it at negative, you would expect the currency pair, in this case, the dollar yen to rise, which is what was exactly happening. So once we are able to determine uh, the longer term or the overarching uh, monetary policy view for the central banks involved in this currency pair, we can see that, okay, the high probability trades are, is to go long. Of course, there are pullbacks along the way, but over the course of a few weeks of over two months, the most prob high probability trades were to go long with regards to dollar yen. Right? Whether you're a position trader or uh, uh, 
over a sorry, very a position trader over like a weekly with a weekly outlook or maybe on a uh, <clears throat> two to three day outlook, the high probability trades would have been to the upside. So naturally, there's also pullbacks along the way. Nothing goes up in a straight line. Conversely, nothing goes down in a straight line. But once we are able to determine what is the overarching uh, pol monetary policy uh, framework in place between the Fed and BOJ, you can determine that, yes, okay, I will, uh, I will be looking to go long the dollar versus the yen. Okay, so then we... As you can see, all the way till November uh, 2022, the dollar yen broke 152. It was uh, the, So basically, this means the Japanese yen was getting devalued very strongly versus the US dollar as the Fed raised interest rates aggressively to combat inflation. Okay, now this brings us to another part of um, what central banks do, right? Okay, you have monetary policy actions, whether you're cutting rates, uh, raising rates, keeping rates steady. The, another thing that central banks can do is intervene in the open market, right? So these are called central bank interventions. So now why this is important? So interventions means they're doing something that is uh, uh, not, not part of the usual framework, right? So now in this period, in October, end October, early November, the Japanese yen was getting overly devalued. And this is not good for Japan as well because as a country, their imports become more expensive, whereas the, their exports are more attractive to the rest of the world, but their imports become more expensive. And this adds to inflationary pres pressures back in uh, Japan. So during this period, the Bank of Japan intervened in the open market so if you this news was um uh of naturally was ca uh captured by all the big media outlets right so if you're paying attention to currency news fx news this you would have seen this uh um uh, intervention by the bank of japan being covered by various media outlets so let's just type boj intervention 2022 Right, so let's go to, yeah, okay. So let's just click on this one for CNBC. So Japan intervenes in the FX market. So what this means is the Bank of Japan, sorry, okay, apologies for that. Okay, so the Bank of Japan was uh, actively engaging in the open market, in the foreign exchange open market by buying the Japanese yen to stem its devaluation, right? So as you can see by this, by the bullet points here, Japanese yen was getting battered. It was getting devalued to, to a level where it was uh, not sustainable for the long term. So thus the Bank of Japan had to intervene in the open market, it, right? And by buying the yen, to prop up its price, right? And as you can see, we mentioned, they still kept interest rates ultra low, but they but because of this policy and with the Fed acting in the opposite direction, their currency was getting devalued very strongly. And, but, and so thus they had to intervene by buying the yen in the open market. So when they do that, you can see it basically created a turning point for the dollar yen. So, the intervention had a major impact on the direction of the dollar yen. And despite uh, the last quarter of 2022, where the Fed was still raising rates and Bank of Japan was still kept their interest rates at negative 0.1, but because of the intervention action called, carried out by Bank of Japan, the dollar yen actually st started to pull back pretty significantly all the way till early January as well. So if if you had caught the news of Japan, uh, the Bank of Japan rather, sorry, uh, intervening in the open market, you would have stopped and and thought to yourself, okay, hang on, there's a big change in, uh, in action by the Bank of Japan, right? They've intervened strongly in the open market, right? In the FX market, in the open FX market, and they have started to buy the yen aggressively to, to stem its devaluation and bring it 
back down to a level where they're probably more comfortable with. So in this scenario, you would have been looking to short the uh, short dollar yen, right? So here in the first 10 months of 2022, you would have been looking to go long generally most of the time. But of course, like I said, nothing goes up in a straight line. So naturally, there'll be pullbacks along the way. So this is where your technical analysis on a daily time frame or H4 time frame will help you identify various support and resistance levels. And then once you know what is the overarching uh, theme, you will uh, deploy your strategies accordingly. So similarly, in end of October, early November onwards, once BOJ had intervened, it was it signaled a turning point in the direction of this currency pair. So over here, you'd be looking to most uh to short dollar yen. But of course, like I said, even on the way down, nothing goes down in the straight line. We have uh pullbacks as well. So this is where you can use combined fundamental analysis with technical analysis. Uh, looking at what central banks are doing and add, and is there anything new or different that they've recently announced and you can combine uh, all these factors to at least determine what is the the, the environment that we are in right so in, this is the uh, as you can see over time as the as time played out the dollar yen from a high of 152 dropped to as low as about yeah, the low, the high 120s, right? It's so 128, around 128. So this is how we can use uh, monetary policy action, uh, keeping out an eye on news, and then uh, mash it all up with technical analysis to give us the best uh, outlook and also to give us a good probab uh to help us set up high probability trades be it, be it long or short okay so we've covered uh the major central banks the calendars what the fed is doing and also looking out for uh interventions right so these are some of the uh key fundamental uh aspects to look out for okay so let's see next would be Okay, I think I will. Okay, so next we'll look at um, uh, economic data, right? Okay. So economic data is, uh, there's a wide range of economic data. So what should we focus on, right? We've got um, many things ranging from GDP to, to employment report numbers and to uh, inflation figures as well. Okay, so one of the key aspects of why the Fed is still continuing to raise interest rates is because the economy is still strong the G and the labor market is still very tight. So what do they mean by a tight labor market? It means uh, unemployment rate is low and total employment numbers are high. So when you have an environment where you have steady economic growth and a very strong and robust uh, labor market, the Fed can continue to raise interest rates, right? Even though they're already at 5%, the upper range is at 5% now, they will still, as you can see in the CME Fed Watch tool, they're very likely to raise another 25 basis points next week. Next week, So this is why uh, it is important to be aware of uh, the current level of economic activity in terms of GDP, PMI surveys, and also the employment uh, report which tells us the unemployment rate and also the uh, total non-farm uh, employment figures. Okay, so uh, let's see, how should I proceed with the next part? Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, okay, before I just proceed and go into economic data, is there anything uh, you guys would like me to touch on or just review what we've discussed. If not, I can just proceed to the next part of uh, this webinar. Okay, so I think, right, okay, so far, no questions. Okay, so we'll uh, just proceed on to the next part. So GDP, right, okay, okay. There's been a lot of talk of uh, recession, right? So let's just look at 
a couple of things. Okay, so let's just look at where the uh, previous PA GDP. Okay. So most of the economic data gets uh, released on a monthly basis. Right, GDP is released every quarter, but along the way, we have the advanced estimate, second estimate, and third estimate. The third estimate is usually the uh, last and final reading uh, for that particular um, period. Um, Okay, I see a question by Raj. Okay, let me check with Desmond on this and see how I can. Uh, I'll feed this. I'll feed back this. Uh, this update. I'll feed back this uh, detail to Desmond, and I will we'll try and sort this out for you guys. All right. Okay. So going back to GDP. Okay. So we after after uh, a technical recession that was experienced in the first half of 2022, the U.S. economy has actually bounced back strongly in the second half of last year. Right, and it's also uh, chugging along quite well uh, uh, this year as well. Okay, so we know uh, the economy has bounced back at the end of second, the second half of last year, and after the banking crisis in March with Signature uh, Signature Bank, SVB, Silicon Valley Bank, there's been a lot of recession talk again. But actually. If we actually we have to look at the underlying economy and how it is actually doing. So right now, the third and final estimate for the Q4 2022, the reading was 2.6%. But what's actually happening in the first quarter, right? So if you look at our calendar, uh, look at our calendar. So if we come to, where is it? Don't we have... Oops, sorry. Okay, let me just change the date. So if you look at our calendar, so today, right? 24th March. Okay, we have GDP, advanced GDP coming up as well. So this is actually the GDP data for the first quarter of 2023, right? Okay, so they are expecting, uh, the, the initial estimate was 2% growth on a quarterly basis. And as you can see, the previous uh, reading, the fourth quarter reading of 2022 came in at 2.6%, which is what we see over here. Okay, but how do we know, how do we, how can we get a better estimate of where the economy currently is? Okay, so another tool that's good to use mm -hmm. is called the GDP Now tool. So if you type GDP Now space Atlanta space Fed, okay, this is Atlanta Fed is one of the, uh, the regional banks, uh, not regional banks, sorry, the governing body, right? Is a, there's the, you have the main Federal Reserve and then you have all the various uh, 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 reserve uh, banks, as, I mean, banks of different regions of the US. So if you type GDP now, Atlanta Fed, what it, it will bring you to a website that actually gives you the estimate, the running estimate, for the current quarter, right? Or the previous quarters. So what now we have moved on into the second quarter of 2023, which runs from April, May to June. And we're going to have the first estimate of the uh, GDP data being announced on 27 April, 12.30 p.m. UTC zero or GMT time. But if you go to the GDP now website, you're actually able to see what is the current estimate for the growth. So the growth is actually coming in at 2.5%. So this is actually higher than the initial estimate of 2% here. And it's not that far off from the fourth quarter uh, figure. So this is actually telling us that the US economy is still growing pretty steadily, despite all the banking fiasco that happened in early March. Majority of it seems to be resolved. And the U.S. economy is uh, chugging along pretty well. So this data is uh, yeah, updated on a weekly, every week. So you can track this website and see exactly how well uh, the U.S. economy is actually going. So this is actually more, uh, gives you more timely update and is more frequent as well because you're able to see the updates uh, every week. 
Okay, then, then another aspect, what is also another important um, uh, figure is the employment report, right? So if we go back to here, we had employment reports for the US announced um, earlier this year, right? Okay, so here. So 7th April, sorry, earlier in April this month. So we have non-farm employment change, which are your NFPs, right? Non-farm payrolls. And you have your unemployment rate. So you click on the folder, go to latest release. It will bring you to the employment situation summary. Now, naturally, we won't have time to read through all this, right? Well, what's important, it's always easy to understand data through charts. So let's just click on news release charts and it'll take you to uh, this page where you have various data points. And here, the first one is the unemployment rate. So the unemployment rate has been uh, ranging between 3.4 and 3.7% uh, for like almost over a year now. So as you can see, unemployment rate is low. So despite all the tech layoffs that we've been hearing about and seeing since the last quarter of last year and even start of this year, you can see it has not had a big impact on the unemployment rate. That could be related to a few things. One is that people who are getting laid off had probably could be a combination of uh, uh, getting hired again rather quickly. And also the tech industry as, as big and as uh, powerful it is, it doesn't represent, it doesn't become a huge significant, uh, fact, significant factor of the total US employment, right? You're just looking one, looking at one sector out of many uh, industries and sectors that make up the US economy. So this is one way of seeing uh, where the unemployment data rate is, uh, rate is. And this is all on a monthly basis. And to look at non-farm payroll numbers, okay, so you click on the filter, go to establishment survey data, and click on employment by industry monthly changes. And click on go. Oh, wait, sorry, not this one. Uh, where is it? Is it? I believe, okay, wait, I think it's, is it employment by industry? Yes, yeah, sorry, okay. So we want to look for establishment survey data and, and then look for the subtitle employment by industry. Okay, so this brings us to the page where we get the total non-farm figures, total private, and also all the various sectors that we can see here. So naturally, after the pandemic lockdowns of 2020, employment numbers crash, unemployment rate spiked, but then ever since then, as economies reopened and uh, people got back to work, whether work from home or physically in office, non-farm payroll numbers have continued to rise uh, pretty steadily and have even surpassed the pre-COVID high. So what this tells us is the labor market is very strong and healthy. So that means the Fed can still continue to raise interest rates if they wish to do so. And obviously, that's not, this is not the only factor that they'll look at. They'll also look at um, PMI numbers, GDP figures, and also, of course, the inflation rate. But this is one of the primary reasons why the Fed would still like to raise interest rates because there's no break in the labor market. It is still very tight and strong with low unemployment and high non-farm uh, employment levels. Okay, so you can break it down into various uh, uh, industries as well. If you look at leisure, hospitality, financial activities, professional and business centers. Is there anything? No, there's nothing on tech particular. Okay, maybe it's probably under information, right? Most likely it could be under information as well. So, yeah, so there's various industry sectors here that you can look at. Okay, now the other one that I would like to look at is uh, PMI data, okay, and inflation. Actually, there's a, I have a very interesting chart here that actually shows us how the inflation, rise infl inflation is actually uh, forecasted by the ISM report, right? In, in, indirectly or inexplicitly, it was uh, 
forecasted. Okay, so if we go back here, sorry, oops. Right, okay. If you look at this chart, this is showing us uh, the annualized CPI of the US versus the ISM prices average. Okay, so, okay, maybe just a quick view on what is ISM. So if you just look, okay, so ISM services PMI, let's click on that and go to their latest release. Okay, so you have various uh, sectors, the manufacturing sector, services sector. Hospital is something relatively new, which was uh, created after COVID or during COVID. But the ones that we want to look out for will be the, the surveys or reports for manufacturing and services. So if you just quickly look at the charts, so you have the headline PMI reading together with the sub indices here. So if you can see, uh, a reading above 50 means that this sector is expanding and growing and a reading before below 50 means this sector is contracting or slowing down. So throughout 2021 and the first half of 2022, the manufacturing sector was still expanding, albeit at a slower rate. And finally, towards the end of last year, the manufacturing sector started contracting. And what, what we want to look out here is for the prices indices. So every month, the various readings, the various sub indices, are, readings for the various sub indices are released. So if the prices indices actually tells us what is uh, the inflation level in manufacturing, manufacturing sector. Similarly, if we go to the services report, the services sector is still strong although it had a month of contraction right at the end of last year it has actually rebounded pretty strongly and the readings are still above 50 indicating that the services sector is still growing and it is actually driving overall economic growth in the us and similarly you will have the prices uh, sub index here as well which tells you whether uh, inflation in the services sector is increasing or decreasing Okay, so by tracking these uh, figures, right, we are able to see the historical uh, performance or historical, yeah, historical performance between ISM prices and the CPI data. So let's just go back to our slides. Okay, so what we are looking at here, the blue line is CPI, Consumer Price Index. This is the headline CPI on an annualized basis. Y O Y is year over year, so annualized basis. So the blue line is annual CPI, which we know hit a high of 9.1% in around June, yeah, middle of last year, before it peaked and has been moderating pretty significantly. So this is good because this is telling us that the Fed's actions of in raising interest rates is having an effect on inflation. So when interest rates are high, your borrowing costs are high, right? Whether you're a, in the manufacturing sector, services sector, you're a household or a business owner, when borrowing costs are high, you will tend not to expand or take on uh, uh, larger uh, projects, for example. So that means demand is slowing down. So when demand slows down uh, and your supply is steady, remember we also had a a bunch of supply chain problems, supply chain problems due to the pandemic lockdowns, but supply chains have also moderated and uh, improved. Rather, sorry, supply chains have improved, and together with falling demand, overall inflation peaked in June of 2020 to last year and has been moderating pretty significantly. But what is important here is to look at the red line. Okay, the red line here is telling us the average of the ISM prices. Uh, sub-index. So remember, there was a survey or report for ISM manufacturing and another one for services. And in both of those reports, there were several sub-index indices, right? And one of the key, the ones that I was looking at was prices. So when you take the average of those two um, sub-indices, we get the red line as we've seen here. And, we, and if we plot it in comparison with uh, CPI, you can see that ISM prices over time generally leads CPI prices to the upside and also to the downside. So on the left side here is your, your y-axis for the 
um, CPI on the right side is your uh, axis for the prices, which is at an index level, not a percentage, just an index level, whereas CPI is measured in percentage. But as you can see clearly over time, ISM prices has led uh, CPI. So what this means is when whether ISM prices moves up or down, it, uh, it is actually telling us that CPI is likely to follow suit. So similarly, after the uh, financial crisis in 08, ISM prices bottomed around the level, around 30, around the 30 level, and started rising. CPI, headline CPI, bottomed at about negative 2% a few months after, and then started rising sharply. So you can see that back then in 2008, CPI, uh, ISM prices were already telling us inflation was going to rise and CPI followed suit. Similarly, in around 2014, ISM prices started to head down first before uh, CPI started falling. So similarly, you could see that inflation is falling here or ISM prices are falling. And this is, means that very likely that CPI will also fall. Similarly, you can see that happen. Uh, over the years, and it also is very obvious here in 2020 and 2021, where after the pandemic lockdowns, demand fell, so naturally prices fall, and then as uh, econ economies reopen um, and, uh, act and uh, activities resume, manufacturing activities resume, services activities resume, although at a uh, well, they resume progressively, right? Nothing we we uh, ev uh, everyone was taking baby steps to reopen at different, yeah, they're, they're all re reopening at various uh rates and stages. So, as you can see here, ISM prices the average started rising pretty sharply at least two to three months ahead of the CPI reading. So, based on this, we could already tell that CPI is expected to rise, right? And if CPI is rising, we have to look at what uh, the Fed is thinking and what were they planning on doing. So if this, if you see ISM prices rising and you also see CPI following suit, it means that the Fed is probably thinking about raising interest rates pretty soon. And then we have to look at what bond yields are doing, right? The, the benchmark bond yield is the 10-year bond yield. So if you can see US bond yields rising quickly, it also usually means that the dollar is going to be in strong demand. So when the US 10-year bond yield rises, the dollar index rises, generally this was a period where um, the dollar would outperform most of its peers, right? Or rather, or probably almost all of its peers. And similarly, the ISM prices peaked, uh, I would say, in the second quarter of 2022, well before CPI peaked and actually started heading down pretty sharply. And this was already telling us that CPI is about, uh, inflation, overall inflation in the United States is about to follow suit. It's very likely going to follow suit. So this is also a period where we saw in the second half uh, of 2022, uh, especially in third quarter onwards, where US bond yields started to fall aggressively. The dollar index also was falling aggressively. So this was a period where uh, inflation uh, was falling. And despite the Federal Reserve raising, continuing to raise interest rates, the dollar index was actually falling and the dollar was losing its, uh, its strength versus all its peers. So this is how we uh, try and predict inflation as well using ISM uh, reports and looking at the prices sub-index. So there was a bit of a scare in, I think, February where the prices index ticked up. But the good thing was in the latest reading for the month of March, it headed down back again. And also the latest CPI reading also continues to fall uh, lower. So it does, for now, it does look that like um, inflation has peaked and should continue to head lower. So looking at ISM prices uh, index, we are able to at least try and uh, reliably, reliably forecast the direction of overall inflation. Okay, so let's just look at 
the dollar index, right? Just to uh, visualize visualize this uh, over a chart or with a chart. So this was a period where inflation was rising. US bond yields were rising, right? The 10-year bond yield was rising. And we also had, naturally, as you can see, the dollar index rising as well. And then uh, as inflation peaked in, although inflation peaked in June, it was still, uh, and started falling, the dollar index was still rising. Bond yields were still rising. It was only here in the third quarter and fourth quarter, at the start of fourth quarter of um, last year, where the dollar index peaked, started falling, and bond yields also started falling. So despite the Federal Reserve continuing to raise interest rates over this period, actually all the moves in FX had actually reversed. Right, so if you look at the euro dollar, so okay, euro dollar. So when the dollar is strong, euro dollar is going to fall. So which is what was actually happening. And then in October and November is when there was a, a big change in the direction of bond yields and also in the dollar index. So when the dollar index started losing its value, naturally the all its counterparts will gain. So this is when the euro had a big strong rally as well. To, and it also is reflected in the pound, the British pound as well. Right. So if you just look at dollar index together with, okay, I'm just going to split the chart. So, okay, top chart is dollar index. Bottom chart, we're going to look for the US 10-year bond yield. So just type US 10Y. You'll get United States 10-year government bond yield. So this is the benchmark yield. So we can, okay, let's just put on a weekly chart because, okay, hang on. Yes, sorry. Okay. Okay. Because bond, okay. It's e easy to visualize uh, the moves between the government bond yields and the dollar index on a weekly time chart. So you can see the longer uh, trends and you can also see the inflection points. So as we've, as I've mentioned earlier, so October, November was the period uh, where several things happened. We had the BOJ intervention as well. And it was also one of the uh, turning points where bond yields peaked, right? The US 10-year bond yield peaked at about 4.3% or close to it. And then it has fallen to about 3.4%, while the dollar index has been falling aggressive, uh, pretty sharply as well. So even though bond, uh, bond yields are relatively uh, or, or historically elevated, the dollar index continued to fall while the Federal Reserve was still raising rates. And it, and it looks like next week they're going to raise, continue to raise interest rates as well. So although this is this is why it's important to also look at what bond yields are doing and what the dollar index is doing, because sometimes it can be a bit, uh, we may not get the complete picture by just looking at monetary policy actions by of the central banks. So if you're just looking at what the Fed was doing at every uh, FOMC meeting, they were raising rates, they're still, and they're still continuing to do so. You And you just were looking at that singular data point, then naturally you would have gotten the, your idea uh, or your over, your overview of the currency uh, pretty wrong, right? So despite Fed raising interest rates, bond yields started to fall, bond yields peak started to fall, dollar index also started to fall, right? So this was something that you would have, uh, you would need to pay attention to and follow uh what the benchmark 10-year bond yield is doing. Right? So if the bond yield stays about 3.5% and continues to head lower, despite the Federal Reserve raising interest rates, the dollar index could continue to fall further as well. Right? So this is how we uh, use fundamental data or how we perform fundamental analysis by looking at uh, what central banks are doing. What Are there any... Uh, uh, divergence between monetary policy actions between the various central banks. We also look at potential interventions that uh, have taken place. Naturally, I think we, we, we definitely can't predict any intervention by any central bank, but it's important to take note when 
an intervention takes place and who has done it and why. And that's also a important potential important turning point in the direction of the currency. We look at economic data such as GDP growth, uh, PMI numbers, unemployment numbers. Because this, okay, the good thing about most of the economic data, it's a release on a monthly basis. So, you know, you don't have to track it every day. You can track it on a monthly basis and form uh, the longer term view of where the market is headed, where what sort of environment are we in. And then from there, you're able to uh, determine the, the right strategies for your trading. Okay. And um, let's see if I, okay, next. Okay, then, okay. Uh, okay, then I'll just go back to the slides and we'll just talk about uh, the US dollar index, right? And the composition. So why is, okay, just a quick history on dollar index. Okay, so basically it was established um, in 1973 after the Bretton Woods Agreement was dissolved. Basically, uh, under Bretton Woods, the goal was the basis for the United States and uh, all the other currencies were pegged to the value of the US dollar. So basically, the Federal Reserve used gold, the value of gold, to peg, uh, to form this foundation of or value of the US dollar and all the other currencies were pegged to the US dollar. But then uh, this agreement was dissolved and the base for the dollar index, the dollar index was established and the base was set at 100. Okay, so that is why you see dollar index ranging between um, at its highest 110, 115 to the low of maybe 90 or 80. So it's all reference to uh, the value of 100, which was established back in 1973. Okay, and the dollar index is consisted of uh, or made up of various currencies which is the euro, the Japanese yen, pound sterling, Canadian dollar, Swedish krona, and, oh, sorry, this should be Swiss franc. Hang on. Yeah, sorry, not Swiss. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Yeah, okay, so the Swiss franc. So as you can see, the biggest component of the dollar index is the euro. So what this tells us is that if we see dollar index moving up very aggressively or falling very quickly, it, it, it means it's very likely that the euro will have the inverse performance, right? Or the opposite performance. So that is why it's also important to note uh, the relative performance of the dollar index together with bond yields. So at least we are then able to uh, establish the direction for the rest of the currency pairs, particularly the euro. Since the euro makes up almost 60% of the basket, it will be the currency that will have the most impact versus the rest of the currency or the rest of the uh, components. Okay, So this is uh, uh, also quite important to know that if you're just going to trade euro dollar, uh, you should be looking at the Fed, the ECB, what they are doing uh, in terms of monetary policy action. It will be uh, important to know what the how bond yields, the relevant bond yields are performing relative to each other. And then once we know how dollar index is uh, performing, rising or falling, it will have the most uh, impact on the euro itself. Okay, so this is about dollar index. So. Naturally, yeah, so if we switch this to, right? So the dollar, the euro will have the tightest inverse correlation to the dollar index, right? So remember this euro is in a uh, 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 pad uh, with the US dollar as the denominator. So if the dollar index is falling, that means this denominator is falling. So hence the euro is going to rise. And conversely, the, the opposite will happen as we see here from June of 2021 all the way to uh, October 2022 where the dollar index over a longer term period was rising uh, very sharply and the euro was falling very strongly. 
Okay, so just to recap before I, yeah, what is the highest leverage offered to traders? Okay, this depends on the, on how Thick Mill has done it, right? Okay, so we won't be, uh, well, uh, covering, answering this question here today, but before I would uh, end the webinar, I would just like to do a quick recap again. Right, so we've gone through uh, the information resource where to get the relevant uh, data. So remember, Forex Factory takes us, gives us, consolidates all the information for us across the various countries and uh, central banks. And then from there, we are able to go directly to the uh, specific source and find out more uh, details about that particular piece of economic data. Right. And then we also have to, we know we have identified uh, uh, the central, which are the major central banks. It's important to note the monetary policy actions taken by them. Also important to note the meeting schedule and also to look out for any uh, interventions that have taken place. Then we look at economic data, right? These are not the only uh, data points, but I would say these are probably some of the ones that are probably a bit more important and you can uh, start tracking these four as well, GDP, PMIs, employment report, inflation. And I've also talked about the dollar index and its components and the respective weightage. So you can see how the rise and fall of the dollar index impacts other currencies, particularly the euro. Okay. Okay. There's a question by Ray. Where can we get the recording? I believe this. Yeah, this recording will be uh, uh, put up on Tick Mills website as well. So I think just look out for um, uh, any emails if you're on their mailing list. Look out. Look out for the emails and also just look at their um, website as well. Okay. When will it be available? Uh, not too sure, but probably maybe by. The second half of this week, I guess, at the earliest, it should be available as well. All right. Okay. Um, okay. Are there um, any questions or would you guys like me to revisit anything that was discussed today? Hey guys, okay. Well, if there's um, uh, no further questions, then I, I would, uh, yeah, I'll just end the webinar uh, now. And I hope this has been a good session for you guys. And um, yeah, I look forward to, uh, yeah, to presenting. I look forward to um, presenting the next session, part two, uh, for you guys. All right, so do look out. For the date, it'll be uh, the information will be released soon, uh, wh whether you're on the mailing list or on their website itself, right? Okay, so do look out for the next available date, and also the recording will be made available as well as well. Okay, so most likely they should be uh, done in the I, I, second half of this week, I suppose. Right? All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good start to the trading week. Yeah, and. Uh, yeah, all right. Yeah, good luck and I look forward to the next session. All right, take care, guys.